everybody, and we're live. Welcome to DNews and NASA JPL's monthly Space Out, where we get together with stars from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We talk about space, technology, the future of planetary science, and all sorts of stuff. Today we're talking about Mars Curiosity. I'm Trace, and with me today is DiscoveryNews.com space producer, Ian O'Neill. How's it going, Ian? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm very lucky today to be on this really special uh, space act because we've got some of the brightest minds in JPL on with us, uh, and they're all um, uh, they're all engineers and scientists with the NASA Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity, as we know him or her. Um, with us today, we've got Ashwin Vasavada. He's the MSL Deputy Project Scientist of JPL's Mission Control, so you can see all the flashy lights behind him. It's very cool. What's that, what's that um, we got. Naji Cox, she's the MSL Tactical Uplink Lead at JPL Mars Yard. There's actually a Mars Yard in JPL, so behind you you can see a little bit of Mars. Um, we've also got Matt Heverly, he's the uh, the MSL Mars Rover Driver at JPL Mars Yard as well, and he's going to be showing us some really cool stuff that the uh, the replica rover can do in the, in the Mars Yard. And as a special guest, we've got Amy Shearer Title. She's a space historian and our newest uh, D News space guest host. So she'll be chipping in, and it's actually funny because I the first time I met her was actually in in Pasadena two years ago when we actually saw. Uh, Curiosity land on Mars, so that was a very cool moment. Um, so really, I wanted to get to the most important question first. Is Curiosity a boy or a girl? <laughs> Who wants to answer that? Because I've been confused about this. I don't like calling it an it. It's not an it. Is it a her or a him, but I don't know which. Well, Matt, what do you call her? Him. Uh, I'll, I'll go for it. I, I always refer to all of our rovers as females, just like you refer to ships or anything, but uh, they definitely have their own personalities and uh, curiosity up on Mars. Uh, we've got our vehicle system test bed here, which some people call Maggie, uh, and all of these rovers uh, typically are female. Cool. Yeah, okay. Cool. Well, well so, uh, so. go ahead, Ian. Just to kick off, I was going to ask actually, Matt, if you wanted to tell me what what what's what's your job? I mean, what do you do with the, with the rover? Um, do, you, do you actually physically drive it? I mean, what actually happens in your in your day to day job? And I'm going to go to each and every one of you just to find out what they do with their specific positions with the with the mission. Um, I my job is I think the coolest job I could ever hope for. Uh, my title is a, a Mars rover driver, uh, and essentially what me and a, a team of other people do, along with Nagi and Ashwin and the rest of the team, is every day we send commands to the rover, and we work with the science team to understand what are their objectives for the day. We work with a whole bunch of other people about telecom and power, um, but our specific job is to drive the rover and operate its robotic arm to accomplish whatever the science team wants to accomplish that day. So we basically come in in the morning, we put on our 3D goggles, we look at this beautiful panorama of Mars, we get our marching orders from the science team, uh, we build a list of commands, and then off they go to Mars, uh, and then the rover drives, uh, sends us back some more beautiful images, and we do it all over again the next day. Cool. cool. And Ash Ashwin, um, what does it take to be a deputy project scientist on this mission? <laughs> Well, a lot of school. I don't know. <laughs> uh, a lot of study. <laughs> exactly. Um, a deputy project scientist just means that I work directly with the project scientist, who's the lead scientist on the mission, and we help corral the 500 scientists around the world who every day uh, decide what we do with Curiosity and what we're trying to figure out on Mars. So it's, it's a big job with a huge science team, but it's also a lot of fun working with all the engineers who execute our plans. Cool. Wow. And Nagi, what's your role as uh, the MSL Tactical Uplink Lead? That sounds very complicated. Yeah, well, that one's technical. It, and it's actually a lot of fun, just like uh, Matt says and Ashwin says. I think we all think we have uh, some of the coolest jobs on the planet. And you heard Ashwin and uh, Matt both talk about how there's a lot to do on Mars, that there's a lot of driving we want to do, there's a lot of science activities. And so my job as the Tactical Uplink Lead is to make sure those kind of all come together so that we actually have a plan uh, at the end of the day because we don't often have a lot of time to decide what we'll be doing the next day. So the tactical uplink lead is kind of in charge of the process of just making sure that the entire team 
has a, a plan for what we want to do the next day and that we get through all of the steps to make sure that that amazing science is also done safely on the rover and that we're ready for uplink at the end of the day so we'll have another great day on Mars right after that. Very cool. Yeah, wow. Well, I suppose so, uh, the, uh, we could start with the opening question. It was, um, yeah. It's been two years now on Mars, so what, one Martian year or two Earth years. Um, Ashwin, what's it been doing? What's this mission been doing in a, in a, in a nutshell? Yeah, in a nutshell, you know, 50% is my answer and 50% goes to Matt because really we've been doing a lot of pretty intense science for the first year and a lot of pretty intense driving for the second year. So I'll tell you about the first year. Uh, from when we landed until about last summer, uh, we've been accomplishing our main mission objective, which is to figure out if Mars ever was a habitable planet. So we drove only just about half a kilometer away from our landing site to where there was an ancient riverbed, and we drove right through that ancient stream bed, found some rounded pebbles, led us to a place where we think a lake once was, and we actually were able to drill into the mud at the bottom of that lake and figure out what the environment was like when that lake was there early in Mars history. So it was a fantastic first year. But then we set our sights on the real reason we went to uh, Gale Crater in Mars, this big mountain off in the distance, and Matt's uh, helped take us there. Cool. So Matt, what's it been like for you the second year? Uh, the second half of the year has been really kind of intense from a, a driving perspective. So as Ashwin said, you know, we, we went to this place called Yellowknife Bay, uh, did a lot of great science, and then there's this giant mountain. Uh, Gale Crater is about the, the size of the Los Angeles Basin with a, uh, a giant five-kilometer tall mountain in the middle of it, and we want to get to the base of that mountain where there's some more interesting geology. Um, but we got about uh, 15 kilometers that we have to drive in order to get there. And we are progressing away uh, uh, every day, trying to make it closer and closer to the base of that mountain. And uh, we got hit uh, around the end of the year last year, kind of November, with some issues with our wheels. Um, we started seeing that the wheels were wearing away faster than we had anticipated. We knew we'd get some cracks and some dents and some dings, but man, they were just uh, getting holes faster than we had anticipated. So we had to figure out a whole new strategy for driving, understand what was causing these problems, why we hadn't seen them before in any of our tests, and what we were going to do about it now that we were on Mars and we, we didn't have ability to change any of the wheels. So it's been a lot of engineering, trying to figure out uh, a new approach to driving the rover, um, and a lot of uh, trying to make progress every single day towards the base of that mountain. Do we, do we know what the cause was? What's, uh, what's going on with the wheels? There, there are a bunch of holes and dings in them. Yeah, so the wheels are machined out of a single piece of aluminum, and the skin of the wheels is only three-quarters of a millimeter thick, which is about ten sheets of paper. And they need to be so thin in order to be lightweight. The rover has to be as low as mass as possible. We have to land. We only had, you know, 900 kilograms that we could land on Mars, and if we use an extra 10 kilograms for the wheels, we can't use that for science instruments. So everybody engineers their, their parts uh, to be as high performance as possible. When we tested here in the Mars yard, we didn't see any real problems, but when we got to Mars, what we found was that the rocks were a lot sharper than we had anticipated. You know, years and years and years of wind-blown sand sharpening these things, and that they're well embedded into the ground. Um, so when the rover drives over them, uh, the other five wheels don't wait while one wheel goes up and over, and they kind of push the rover into these really sharp rocks. And that's fundamentally what's causing these punctures, and we never saw it in any of our terrestrial testing before launch because we never tested in that kind of environment. We tested on lots of sharp rocks, but they were kind of thrown out on the surface. They weren't embedded into the ground. Um, so that's one of the, the things about exploring. You kind of never know what you're going to find. Uh, it's one of the things that I think we are amazing here at JPL, really, really fantastic scientists and engineers that can deal with some of these problems that inevitably come up, uh, which is kind of the nature of exploration. That's so cool. Like, you learned something even without meaning to in that, in that respect. <laughs> really yeah. amazing. I wish we didn't have to learn that, but uh, <laughs> we've, done, we've done all the right. The hard lesson. <laughs> well, I, was, I was reading about the, the puncture issue, and um, one of the solutions is for the rovers to drive backwards. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things you can see with the rover, you can see it in the background, we've got this suspension system, and some of the wheels are in front of these arms, these pivots, and some of them are behind the pivots. And the analogy that people make is when you're, you're dragging your suitcase through the airport, if you've got your suitcase behind you and you hit a bump, it kind of lifts up and over. But if your suitcase is out in front of you and you hit a bump, 
uh, it'll go down and you kind of stumble over it. And when our wheels are in front of the, the suspension arms and the pivots, it's the same thing as driving with your uh, suitcase out in front of you. So by turning around backwards, we're sacrificing the rear wheels, but we're protecting the middle wheels and the front wheels a little bit more over these kind of sharp, well-cemented rocks. Hmm. Really cool. cool. Um, I have a question for Nagi about what you mentioned earlier that you have to, it, I mean, your title says tactical uplink, right? And you don't get to drive, Matt's not driving live, is that correct? Or is he, is he driving as, like, does he send a command and it goes right now? Or are you sending them all as a, a packet as, well, you, as you say once a day? Uh, it, while it would be great to be able to send them uh, quickly and see what happens right away, we actually can't do that because of the time it takes uh, a signal to get from the Earth to Mars, which can vary from, you know, like 8 to 20 minutes. That means that we can't really joystick the rover. So just as you said, we are in fact packaging the commands and sending them all together as a program that we uplink at the end of our Mars planning day and then that goes to the rover so that when she wakes up the next day, she has she looks at her memory bank, sees what she should do the next sol, and then executes those commands, and we're not actually uh, in contact with her at the time. So she goes through her day, and then she'll send home her data uh, in the Martian afternoon using some of our relay orbiters, and then we hear from her later in the day, and that's when we kind of begin our planning day. So we kind of we work the Martian night shift. So when she starts resting, we go to work getting ready her uh, her commands for uh, what she'll do the next day. What do you do when she's on the other side of the sun from us? Uh, well, there's a time period that we that was uh, called conjunction when, in fact, that we aren't able to uh, command her because the sun uh, uh, is in the is in the way, as you said, between the Earth and Mars. And in that time period, she kinds of gets a little bit of a vacation, so to speak, because we want her to be doing very minimal activity while we aren't able to be in communication with her. And that's actually a time also when the team has uh, an opportunity to work on other things. And, and develop some new strategies, et cetera, for how we're going to continue the mission because in that time period as well, we have usually about a two, two and a half week time period where we're not doing tactical operations. Uh, but the rest of the time, we try to utilize just, you know, every day on Mars uh, as much as we can. Some of us go on Very vacation cool. during conjunction. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the best That's time I imagine time. to get away. <laughs> It is. It's, it's a time when it doesn't uh, impact the science that we do if we sneak away for a little bit of Earth vacation as well. Do you guys live on Mars time, Matt, Ashwin? We did initially. For the first 90 days of the mission, we lived on Mars time. So we always showed up to work at approximately 5 p.m. on Mars when the data was downlinked to Earth, no matter what time it was here on Earth. Um, and the Mars day is 40 minutes longer than the Earth day, so you essentially show up to work 40 minutes later uh, every day, it was it was fun, but it was a, a little bit like uh, jet lag, you know, at one time yeah. each day. Interplanetary did go, lag. Did you go crazy? It was co like I imagine at first, you know, after a few days, you're getting to work really late, and after a few weeks, who knows? I, I don't even <laughs> want to do the math. <laughs> you can't plan ahead. I don't even know when to set my alarms. Wow. Um, the process of working on Mars time is something that we've gotten better over time, and we did it some on Mars Pathfinder and on Spirit and Opportunity, and in those cases, we learned exactly what you said. As Matt said, it's, an, it's a blast, but it is hard uh, for family, for you know, people to keep up with, for humans to do for, for more than a few months at a time. So we've kind of found that about 90 sols is a good amount of time for the team to all be together in those first 90 sols. All of the scientists are here at um, are here at the lab, and it's a wonderful time for us to learn how to work as a team. But after a while, people need to go to their home institutions and return to their families, and we've definitely gotten better at learning how to do this remotely. So that now when we plan a day on Mars, we have people from all over the world participating, but they're able to do so remotely. And one of the biggest changes tactically in the last uh, uh, Mars year is that we've learned to do that process of getting the commands ready for the next sol faster than we did before. So we started out with a timeline of taking about 16 hours to prepare the commands for Mars uh, the next day, and now we're down to about 10. 
So while we've been learning new strategies to drive and accomplishing uh, the science that we came to do, we've also been getting more efficient about how we do our daily planning so that we can fit in even more uh, on each day on Mars. Very cool. I have a question about uh, planning drives on Mars, if I can raise my hand. Uh, <laughs> um, <yeah>. Amy. <laughs> thank you. So, Nikki, I know you mentioned that you were on the Mer Rover Spirit and Opportunity as well as Curiosity, obviously. Um, and I'm kind of curious because you're also mentioned that you're going into a new drive mode that's allowing Curiosity to actually take in more about its surroundings. I'm sorry, I, I call it an it. Um, <laughs> take in more about its surroundings and sort of make more um, educated decisions about what it can and cannot drive over. Um, can you kind of just talk a little bit about how, like, how the state of the art of driving on Mars has advanced in the last decade? Because um, I know that when you launch something to Mars, you're sort of frozen in time technologically when you launch. So how, what have you been able to sort of take from Spirit and Opportunity and bring into Curiosity? And how, I mean, how much have you advanced that? Because that's really cool. <laughs> we have indeed. Uh, it's been wonderful to have a program where there are there's you know rovers and then additional rovers then where we can learn from each one and you're absolutely right that when we launch we are of course frozen in terms of hardware and so the next opportunity to improve the hardware is for the next mission however one thing that we can improve regularly is the software that we have we're able to give uh, the rovers kind of a a new set of programming uh, at various times during the mission and we have tremendously benefited from the advances that Spirit and Opportunity made over their very long-lived missions. We expected them to last for only 90 sols, you know, three months on Mars, and, and Opportunity is still going. Uh, one of the huge benefits of that is that we've been able to make advances in how the rover knows where it is, in odometry, in visual odometry, in autonomous navigation. Many of the things that we are doing on, on Curiosity was uh, first developed by uh, in the later parts of the mission on Spirit and Opportunity. We were also fortunate that not only do we inherit some of the lessons and uh, the opportunity to improve the hardware, but we also inherit some of the people. And we have some of the same programmers who have been with us since Pathfinder, some of the same engineers on who program Sojourner, Spirit and Opportunity, and as such, they bring with them the knowledge not only of how to make the driving more autonomous, how to be able to drive further, but also how to implement these things on Mars safely. As one of the uplink leads, what I look for, as, do the, as does the rest of the team, is when we're ready to, to kind of roll out a new capability, it goes through a very careful process of, of some of our, our engineering team and scientists and everyone evaluating how to start improving, but to make sure we do it slowly and safely so that we're very careful with this uh, amazing asset that we have on Mars so that we can both advance and still be careful with the rover. Yeah, and um, speaking of uh, the hardware, specifically of uh, Curiosity, um, and this question goes out to everybody, but um, why is, uh, this is actually a question from one of our readers, one of our uh, viewers, uh, from uh, Nikos Mav, oh no, Mav, Mar oh, Mavro yes, Kafalos, Mavro Kafalos, Nikos? That's it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Nikos. I'm sorry, Nikos. Um, he's got a good question. Um, he's, he's asking, you know, how many selfies of curi how many selfies is curiosity, curiosity taking of itself, and why? I mean, why, why are we seeing all these wonderful high definition shots of basically curiosity taking pictures of its own hardware? I mean, what's the purpose behind that, or is it just a very vain rover on Mars? <laughs> he's not vain. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. Um, it's a really cool thing that uh, one of our scientists uh, came up with. We didn't even really know that he was working on it, but uh, the people down in San Diego at Malin Space Science Systems who um, put our uh, arm-mounted camera on the rover developed this technique kind of um, in secret. Uh, they were hoping it would work, and they tried it out uh, here at JPL on the, on the test rover that's here. And then we actually tried it out on Mars. You know, it, it actually took over 55 images uh, to stitch together to make that first selfie uh, at our very first uh, sampling location where we scooped soil. And we actually ended up uh, realizing how wonderful it was to as sort of like a historical picture of where we sample. Uh, we only sample every few months with Curiosity. And so you know now we actually have a tradition of taking one of these selfies every time 
uh, were at one of our big uh, sampling sites. So we took one where we scooped, took another one where we drilled later on, and then we just took one at our, our next drilling site. So I believe the answer is three. Um, but they're, they're really cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And to add to that, uh, it, they, as with many un uh, capabilities that, that you don't plan on having, it has a lot of different utility. And so, yes, it's a, a wonderful image for, for helping people see and imagine themselves on Mars when they can see this rover on Mars. But also from an engineering perspective, a, a, the, the chance to kind of see yourself has a lot of advantages, some of which we learned on Spirit and Opportunity. You can take a look at the calibration targets. You can see kind of the state of some of the hardware, see what it, see kind of how it looks on Mars. And, and that is kind of an important data point relative to when we last saw it on per, in person, of course, which was before we launched. So there are beautiful, evocative human aspects to being able to see the rover on Mars, there's science aspects that you uh, you know that you were hearing Ashwin talk about in terms of this unexpected capability, and in addition, it kind of baselines the rover for for what the what the hardware, the condition of the hardware, a visual opportunity to see some of that at a at a at a low resolution uh, at various uh, stages in time as well. Yeah, I, I noticed in some of the pictures that um, Curiosity was taking of herself. You can see how dusty she'd get. She's she's got only in um, in a couple of years. It seems like a very short amount of time, and the dust really impacted Opportunity solar panels. And even though Curiosity doesn't have that issue as much, is that dust causing problems for Curiosity? Well, I can let uh, Ashwin can weigh in afterwards as well. From a, from a engineering side, as you said, we the primary issue that Opportunity has uh, of the the solar panels. We don't. There are, there are still things that we want to be very careful with in terms of not getting dust on many of the camera lenses. And they have, like Molly, our, our camera on the robotic arm, has a protective cover. We still think about that as we do activities, you know, which is if you're doing something that, uh, you know, that has the opportunity to kind of kick up some dust, so to speak, then just like a human would, you, a human will, you know, will, t will pay attention and make sure we kind of look down at the ground while something uh, is happening. So we try to take care of our eyes and protect them from dust, uh, just we, as we would on Earth. And, and I'll uh, throw it to Ashwin in case he'd like to add something there. I think the number one thing that we're concerned about with dust is what Nagi is talking about, the optics, uh, keeping all those sensitive surfaces clean. Uh, the uh, other more subtle thing is the rover is white, uh, you know, not just because we chose that color out of the catalog. Um, but it actually is white, so it, uh, it it's part of the thermal design of the rover. You know, Mars is an extreme thermal environment. because a lot of sun in the day, and, um, and the rover needs to stay warm at night. So that white paint has some thermal characteristics that we want. And so we actually had to do some calculations of how much dust might settle on the rover over the mission and make sure even when, when we lose that whiteness, that ability to reflect sunlight uh, and then emit heat differently at night, we'd still be able to... Uh, to uh, have a safe rover. So it's a subtle thing, but it does matter. And, and we're still very safe and within the, uh, what we designed for. We love having the RTG, the uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Uh, that gives us that constant 110 watts of energy. We don't have to worry about dust covering solar panels on this mission at all. Yeah, that's got to be a, a, good, a, a good scientific bonus to not have to have that one, one less consideration in terms of how much sunlight you're getting at this moment or this season or where you are. You can drive into the shade if you want. <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing with uh, Curiosity. It's become quite a quite the astronomer. It's uh, taking, it's able to hang around at night and take pictures of the night sky, isn't it? Um, we, yeah, we were able to take some, uh, a lot of the astronaut, uh, sorry, ast astronomy pictures. Uh, we uh, woke up early in the mission and caught Phobos uh, and Deimos, the moons. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I think the person on our team who schedules these things just kind of started going nuts. And you know, we had <laughs> Phobos and Deimos in the same picture, Phobos crossing Deimos, Deimos in front of the sun, Phobos in front of Jupiter. You know, I mean, every combination it seemed like <laughs> you could think of. Uh, and then, we, of course, we got this beautiful picture of uh, Earth uh, in one day. And, and so you know, it's, it's nice to be able to use the rover at night also. It requires a little special planning to wake up in the middle of the night and use a little extra energy to heat up the cameras and the mast to point the cameras. Um, what we're really looking forward to in October is uh, Comet Siding Spring, which will uh, 
pass by uh, pretty close to Mars, and we'll we'll try to get some pictures of that. And to add to that, uh, the the beautiful picture that we got of Earth. Uh, that sticks out in my memory because I was actually on, on duty that day. And what I remember is we were working so hard to make sure that we got our plan for the day that I also, you know, I had us kind of pause at the moment that we were sequencing or, or preparing the commands to take the picture of the Earth and said, you know, hang on everybody, let's think about what we're doing for a second here. We're going to be taking a picture of the Earth from Mars. And, and so we had kind of a smile pretty moment. Uh, where where we all step back from the the technical aspects of preparing the plan, and and reminded ourselves of what we were actually doing, taking a picture of ourselves from another planet, it was remarkable. That's really amazing. We've got it there. You can see it on the. Yeah, that's the amazing. Here. That's pretty cool. Yeah, wow. you know, and the, I should add, um, you know, one of the things we do when we're taking pictures of Phobos and Deimos is actually measuring the timing of their orbits much more accurately than we can do from Earth uh, telescopes, for example. Like, we, we really know where the Sun is, and we really know where Mars is. So if we catch Phobos and Deimos transiting the Sun, you know, between Mars and the Sun, by taking those pictures, we can get the timing of their orbits. And their orbits do change. Uh, being these small moons, their orbits evolve as they go over topography of Mars. And, and we can actually learn something about the interior of Mars by seeing how the orbits of Phobos and Deimos change. Wow. wow. So That's cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> now we just went, wow. Yeah, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> this is great. Um, <laughs> now there's, um, I, I just want to cut to a question quickly. I mean, this is going a little bit back to the, um, the dust issues we were just discussing. Um, there's a question from Twitter from uh, John Geyser. Uh, what un unanticipated issues have you encountered, and what have you done to fix them? And what, it, what current issues do you have that concern you? So obviously we talked about the uh, the rover's wheels as being a, an ongoing issue that's manageable. Uh, what other issues have you had? I mean, because I haven't really heard an awful lot. I think the biggest uh, surprise recently was the wheels. Yeah. Um, I think the overall biggest uh, surprise we had on the mission was really a hardware-related surprise. Uh, on SOL 200, uh, just you know, 200 days into the mission, uh, we encountered a problem where um, there was a fault in the memory of our A-side computer. We have two you know, computers, so we have a, a prime and a spare. Uh, there was a fault in the memory that then went and found a unknown software bug. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, Amy can probably <laughs> tell us about this too, but, you know, you really worry in space when you get multiple problems in a row. You know, usually you can design systems to handle one problem and recover from it. But when you get one problem that triggers another problem, or maybe a third, then you're really in trouble. It's hard to design something to be resilient to that. So we had a pretty scary night on SOL 200 when this uh, fixable problem encountered another fixable problem, but together they created a much higher, uh, harder problem. The entire computer system was hanging for several hours, and we needed to do some emergency commanding from Earth to rescue Curiosity by switching to the backup computer. Uh, since then, we've been on the backup computer, and just last week, we actually ran into a, a little problem um, having to do with how we f first fixed the A-side computer. So there's been some hardware issues that have slowed us down. But really, you know, fortunately, like Matt said earlier, we have, we have the best people in the world here to address these things, and, and we made it out alive of that one. And one of the things to add to that is we had a similar situation on uh, Spirit well, right after, soon after we landed. We had the Sol 18 anomaly. And it was also related to software and flash memory. And while those are always, uh, you know, important lessons learned, and that that we, in each case, were able to recover, I think one of the key things that we do and that we've learned over many years of, of planetary exploration is you can't always know at all what might happen. But what you can do is put in place broad safety nets that allow you to recover even if you don't know the cause of what what might happen. And on Spirit, that was an example of that. There was a, a command that we were able to call upon that said, if you for some reason don't have your flash memory, here's a way to boot up. And that same approach to keeping broad safety nets has been very helpful with uh, Curiosity as well because you can have Different different things go wrong software-wise than you could have anticipated, uh, but we, what we can do is try to develop a robust fault protection system, 
fault tolerance so that if something happens unexpectedly, as it often does in exploration, we at least have multiple layers of safety nets uh, that help us make it through the day, just as Ashwin said. Very cool. I have a question about that, actually. Um, two parts question, actually. Um, have you been able to get the A computer back up or no? Or will you be able to, do you think? Uh, well, the, the uh, A-side computer actually is still working fine. And what we were doing, um, as Ashwin said, we have a part of it that, uh, that we kind of isolated after the Stall 200 anomaly and said, you know, we think that's the area where there's a software issue. So while we're, while we're working through that, let's not access that area. And the, the issue that we had the most recently, uh, the computer had, uh, had an issue as it was reading that area, but then it booted up fine. And what we did do along the lines of these safety nets is we said, you know, it looks like that was something momentary on the A-side computer, but let us be careful and stand down from operations for one or two solves just to make sure that it's still a viable backup because we still, it's still important to have two computers in case you're very busy doing something complicated on Mars and you find you need that backup. And all of our investigation so far has said that it's fine as a backup and so we've resumed our nominal operations. But what we are looking into is, uh, we, is, is are there ways to make uh, our, our checking of RCEA, of the A-side computer, even more robust? Because even though it's the backup computer, we check on it periodically and uh, as a result of what happened a, a, a week or so ago, where we have some thoughts on how to make sure it, it, it uh, is even more robust. So, but it's doing fine. So my second question, given that the computer is looking good, I know your RTG, you have something like 12 more years of power um, before you really start to see a, a slowing down of the rover. Um, the hardware issues that you've seen and been able to recover from, how long do you think you'll be able to keep on rolling with Curiosity before you start to run into issues of power and systems having to shut down? Well, do you think the hardware is going to stand up for another dozen years? <laughs> well, we hope to go a long time and follow the pattern of, uh, of opportunity. Um, from kind of a, a, a planning perspective, we know that we have uh, another few years, uh, probably another couple of years, of where we are kind of just as robust as we are now to power and can operate everything at the same time. After that, it becomes similar to other missions where we'll need to start watching the power probably in the next um, uh, at about two years from now, we'll start to say, uh, or even uh, perhaps a little bit more, we'll start to say, well, we could have this instrument on and, and maybe not this instrument, and we'll start to manage the power. But we definitely have, you know, a good five, seven years ahead of us where it, it'll be a man, it, it'll be a matter of uh, uh, a matter of of taking a look at what we can have on simultaneously. Uh, but we are a long way from really having to restrict our operations significantly for power reasons. One of the benefits of having an RTG. But it will be going down, you know, on a gradual slope. Got it. That's very interesting. Um, is Matt, Matt back? To that. Yeah. Matt, are you back? Can You want to unmute? Uh, yep, Matt's back here. Hey, Matt, welcome back. Thanks. We got a question from Twitter. What's your, what's your top speed? From Mr. Filibuster. His name's uh, Eric Stevens. Our, our top speed, pedal to the metal, all systems maxed out, is a whopping 0 0.1 miles an hour. Uh, Woo! It's wow. on. <laughs> Whenever we're up here in the Mars yard, and kids are like, make it move, make it move. It's like, really? It's pretty boring when you watch it move. But uh, <laughs> the, the nice thing about that is that we got plenty of torque. So our limited commodity is power. And as Nagi mentioned, we've got our, our RTG, which generates about 100 watts. You know, it's a light bulb. So we're powering this giant 900-kilogram uh, rover on a light bulb. And nice. we don't have a lot of power to use for speed, and we want to use it for torque. So the motors are actually spinning really fast, and there's a big gearbox in there. And each wheel uh, can generate enough rim thrust to lift the rover straight up a wall in Mars gravity. So we don't have any Whoa. problem going up and over rocks. We just go up and over rocks slowly. Um, and the nice thing is robots don't get bored, so when it takes you a few hours to drive uh, 100 meters or so, uh, the robot doesn't complain. It's just the people in the Mars yard that have to watch it when we're testing it. How does that compare to, like, Opportunity? Does Opportunity go faster? No, all of our rovers are pretty similar speed. We're really 
we want to have the ability to get out of any bad situation we're in, which is why we want a lot of torque in the wheels. We don't ever want to try and get over a rock or try and get up a hill and not be able to make it because the rover just can't get enough oomph to get up the hill. Um, so all of our systems, you know, we're extremely power limited. Spirit and Opportunity have the solar panels, uh, and they have a similar power concern. So we just don't uh, we don't tend to go fast, but we have a lot of torque when we need it. Yeah, and kind of related to um, can you oh, talk right. about some? Oh, sorry. Can I? Um, <laughs> can you it. talk about some of the tests, the ways that you sort of in the Mars yard use your your backup rovers? And I know the the Scarecrow as well um, to kind of test ways that you can get out of jams on Mars. Like, uh, yeah. So we you we ever just kind of go nuts to see how far you can push it? <laughs> <laughs> we have two <laughs> test beds. The one that you see behind us is the exact replica of Curiosity on Mars, and most people use this for software for uh, communication, for, uh, you know, things like that, because the rover is actually too heavy to drive correctly. So it weighs the same, uh, it has the same mass as Curiosity on Mars, which means it weighs too much here on Earth because of our gravity. So what we have, I'm going to pan, I'm going to spin around over here, and what you can see on the hill behind us is our rover called Scarecrow. So Scarecrow oh. is a Mars weight version of uh, the rover. It weighs here on Earth what Curiosity weighs on Mars, um, and we use that as our mobility test bed. So this is what we use to drive over big rocks and drive up slopes. And what you can see here in the Mars yard is we've attempted to recreate a lot of terrain that we might see on Mars. We've got rocks, we've got slopes that are made with bedrock and slopes that are made with uh, soil, and then we've got a sand pit where we can drive, and then we actually take Scarecrow out on field tests. We've gone out to the Mojave Desert a few times because those sand dunes we think are similar to the sands on Mars. Um, so the trick is we have to have an exact replica of the rover to have the same computer, same cameras, the same processing, but we also have to have a special rover um, because we can't adjust our gravity knob here on Earth. Scarecrow looks very skinny. I want to go visit. Can you say, what is, what is going on, sorry, can we pull the wide shot up? I am not allowed to yeah, direct these things, but what is going on with that half set of rover wheels going in a circle? Is that a wheel? Yeah, I wondered about that too. Longevity what is going on test? Do you have spikes in the ground that you're trying to break them That's with? What happens? Question, like, yeah. so what I want to know what that is. <laughs> Let's see if I've got this thing going around here. This can is our we... life test track. Oh, wow. It's like at Ikea. This is, it is just like Ikea. You see that thing sitting on the chair over and over again. Yeah, um, and it just sits on the chair. So we've got half a rover that's driving in a circle here, and we run it 24 hours a day, and we can change the terrain. So we can make especially harsh terrain. We can make benign terrain. Um, and what we're attempting to do is understand how the wheels wear in different terrain. What are the things that are causing damage? Are they big rocks? Is it just repeated strikes on small rocks? Is it bedrock, sand? What is the, the combination? And how do we attempt to uh, predict what the wheels are going to be able to do on Mars? Um, so we've got lots of, you know, the Mars yard is a pretty busy place these days. Uh, and we're trying to answer lots of different questions uh, with each of our different test platforms. Um, and this is one of the, the fun things for engineers, I think, about space exploration is there's so many variables that we have to account for, uh, vacuum, temperature, uh, gravity, that we can't test here, so we have to figure out a creative way to, to understand what's going to happen when we get to Mars. That is so neat. Yeah, I wondered about that as well. Good job, Amy. Right, that's cool. So what have you been working on today in the Mars yard? What have you been driving around? Today we're testing software for autonomous navigation. So one of the things we're doing for the rover to, to help the wheels is Ashwin and the science team has helped us identify areas where we see sand from orbit. And sand doesn't have these sharp embedded rocks, so it's nice and gentle on the wheels. But driving in sand presents its own challenges. So the rover, we can command it and say, drive a meter forward, turn right 10 degrees, drive another meter. Or we can give it a high-level command to say, drive over there and keep yourself safe. And the rover can use its autonomy um, to take stereo images, has uh, stereo cameras, builds a three-dimensional terrain mesh of the world around it, and then it can decide on its own what's safe to navigate and what's not. And the terrain that we've seen so far is, is usually pretty flat with rocks kind of strewn all over, so we're attempting to avoid those rocks. But now that we're getting into the sandy areas, we get a lot of undulations and sand ripples, and the rover becomes afraid of those because it looks like a rock when all you have is geometry to evaluate safety. Uh, you don't have the context that we as humans would have of, oh, this is sand versus that's a rock. So we're attempting to tweak. We have 40, uh, 4,000 different 
parameters and knobs that we can uh, turn in order to make AutoNav interpret the world differently and react to it differently. So we're attempting to test uh, how we turn some of those knobs to make it uh, easier to drive in sand ripples. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, we got a picture of the, uh, the sand here, haven't we? Yeah, I think we do. And there's there a bit is. of throwing the ripples of sand. Very cool. Yeah, that, and that I can see that would be difficult to analyze. I mean, that's you got to figure out how to analyze all of that and then drive over it, right? Yeah, that's when all cool. you have is a collection of points, that's what we have from the stereo data, is just points of uh, here's where something is in a three-dimensional space. How do you evaluate if that's safe to drive over or not? And how uh, do we decide between a rock that's dangerous versus a sand ripple that's not? Uh, and that's the the fun challenge of the robotics aspect of this mission. One of the things that's really spectacular about Curiosity uh, is the context we have of being, you know, late in the Mars program when we have all these orbiters at Mars before us. Uh, Curiosity's landing site is mapped much better than, uh, like, Vikings was uh, specifically, and then even better than Spirit and Opportunities were at the beginnings of their mission. You know, after the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter got to Mars and uh, was able to take these incredible high-resolution images and stereo maps of, uh, of Gale Crater and other parts of Mars, we're able to actually drive the rover off of images taken from orbit. I mean, that's, that's kind of amazing, you know? We actually know what's coming around the next corner, and we can predict whether we're going to see boulders or sand or cliffs or ledges or uh, rough ground or smooth ground, all that kind of stuff we can get a good head start on from orbit. And, um, you know, one of the things that we did to respond to this extra wheel damage that we've been getting is, as Matt said, you know, rerouting the whole uh, path to Mount Sharp, transitioning from what we initially had as a path that took uh, kind of a, um, all the plateaus. You know, the rover drivers really like to see off in the distance. And so we were driving plateau to plateau. Turned out, you know, in, in, in perfect hindsight, it makes sense, all those plateaus were plateaus because they rode much slow, more slowly than the stuff in between. That means they're hard, and that means they, you know, after the, the sand gets there, the hard rocks turn pointy. And it turns out it's much better to be off of those plateaus and in the valleys. So it's been this really nice um, experience, you know, with the scientists, the geologists weighing in their expertise on where to find the sandy valleys and the rover drivers advising on what terrain is, is best for the safety of the rover and the wheels and putting that together and picking the sort of ideal route uh, to get to Mount Sharp. That's cool. Kind yeah, of. I've actually got, I've actually got, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's also an example of, of uh, kind of the typical way when we're in operations that we end up solving problems is running multiple things in parallel. So on the one hand, when you see, oh, the wheels take more wear if we drive in this terrain, you know, the first quick response that you get is, okay, how about if we not drive in that terrain? And that's something that you can implement right away. And meanwhile, there are, there are a number of other solutions or possible solutions all being worked in parallel. You have the scientists saying, well, to what extent can we figure out where we want to go from the orbital information? Meanwhile, on the engineering side, a real life test like the one you see behind us uh, in the Mars yard is also being designed. So a key a key to when problems come up is finding ways to to pursue many possible solutions at the same time so that you don't lose time in your actual exploration mission. So initially we were driving while trying to avoid that terrain so that we could keep driving while also looking into ways to long-term mitigate it by orbital data, driving backwards, some of the things you've heard us talk about already. So, since you brought up uh, Mount Sharp, and our, is there any plans once we get there uh, to try and climb up Mount Sharp at all? Can the rover even go up a, a slope that we have there? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I'm going to call for one of the, the pictures that we can put up on the screen, the Mount Sharp layers. Yeah, and this, by the way, this question's from Tony Spiegel on the Mars Curiosity Facebook page. All right. So for Tony, um, here's Mount Sharp. And what you can see in the foreground is all the distance that we have to cover even just to get to the base of Mount Sharp. Still have several kilometers left. But once we get there, you, you can see that you, know, you start getting into some foothills, these nice rounded uh, buttes. 
that contain a lot of the kinds of minerals that we're interested in, in, in looking at with Curiosity because they take water to form. You know, what's cool about Mount Sharp is that it's layered rock like the Grand Canyon or other places where, you know, sediments have laid down over time and created this record of, of rocks. The base of Mount Sharp is made out of clay type minerals that interacted with water and formed clays. The higher um, rocks where you see these rounded buttes tend to have what we call sulfate minerals. These salts that are left behind when uh, water maybe was becoming more scarce in Mars' atmosphere over time. And then the top of Mount Sharp, actually the uh, upper half of it, is probably just Mars dust that's now caked together and turned into rock. We're really not that interested in the Mars dust in terms of looking for a habitable environment on Mars. So what we need to get to with Curiosity, we need to drive across those plains that you see in the foreground, and then we need to get maybe about uh, 500 meters in elevation up the mountain through some of those uh, those rounded buttes, and then we'll really have hit all the places we want to explore on Mount Sharp. So fortunately, we don't have to climb the whole thing. Uh, most of the, the action is down in the foothills. What about, are there caves um, on Mount Sharp? Can we spawn another question from another viewer wanted to know if there were caves up there? You know, we haven't seen any caves yet, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if there if there were some. We have seen some pretty large, uh, what we call veins. Um, veins are, are like where there's a, a crack in the rock, and then water flowed through and left minerals behind. So sometimes it, we've seen this dark uh, basaltic rock that is typical of Mars, and there'll be a white crack through it. And that crack is, is a crack that water flowed through for a long time, left these white minerals behind, kind of stuff that dissolves out of water, calcium sulfate, um, like in my bathtub at home. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we've seen giant versions of that on Mount Sharp. Some of that could re-dissolve away and create a cave, uh, just like the way some caves might form on Earth. That was from Syed Rashan. So, sorry, Syed, we don't know about caves yet. We'll, we'll have to figure it out. Let's get more, let's, let's get up there. <laughs> yeah, just curious to have a flashlight that you can shine down into one of the caves that we kind of just poking around in the dark. Yeah, we, we do have a flashlight. We don't have headlights. You know, there was actually a real discussion a few years ago whether we should outfit Curiosity with headlights. And we ended up deciding that we're probably going to need to sleep most nights, which we do, uh, and we would need to, you know, extend our driving into the night. Um, but we do have uh, the camera on the end of the arm, the same one that takes all those great selfies. And on the, it actually has some lights around the edge of the camera, sort of like the camera that your dentist uses or something, you know, where you can put a, the camera right up to the surface and light up the surface. We've actually used that to take pictures at night. You know, what, what, one thing that's kind of cool about that is Mars always has all this dust in the atmosphere. So it's like a hazy day on Earth. And because the dust is all red, when you're on Mars, everything is sort of polluted with red light. Uh, you know, your human eyes would adjust to it, but when we take like a, a digital picture that captures colors very accurately, everything is sort of pinkish and orangish and washed out. But when you wake up at night and the sun is off, <laughs> you know, the sun's gone, and you just use a white LED, you can actually take the only real color pictures of Mars surface. And so oh, we've wow. done that a couple of times. What is it? What's the? Uh, do the colors change? Because it looks so red in, during the daytime. Does it look red at night? Yeah, you know, it's still, the rocks are still co covered with the orange dust, but when you brush the dust away, the rocks are actually pretty gray. And so when you take pictures at night, uh, you, you tend to, it just feels more Earth-like. It just reinforces the fact that a lot of these materials that we see on Mars, the basalt in the rocks, the clays, the oxidized uh, dust, we see the same stuff in deserts on Earth. Uh, and, you know, when you take out that, the, the sort of washed out pinkness of the daytime, you, you really, um, it, it looks more Earth-like. Early in the mission, especially, we, we, we started releasing two versions of many of our mosaics, and one was the, the Mars lighting conditions, and one was the sort of uh, uh, pink, you know, haze removed, and those do just strike you as a lot more Earth-like. Yeah, yeah, I've seen some of those images, too, and I think everybody probably has, and they, sometimes it, it's uncanny how much it looks like you're standing in a desert somewhere, uh, and you could be here on at home. It's incredible. There's so many familiar things. It was like um, this probably extends to a larger question, but um, when I saw the images of the uh, river basin uh, that Curiosity was standing in, the ancient river basin, and you could see little uh, pebbles. To me, that was 
that was most that was probably my favorite discovery just this very earth life phenomenon to show that there was water once running on the on the martian surface um I suppose that kind of extends because that's my favorite uh, discovery. I'm just wondering what your favorite discoveries are so far, um, or weirdest discovery, or just something that you love about this mission that's really kind of grabbed your attention. So we well, start with Ashwin. Sure, um, you actually stole mine, Ian. Uh, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no, it's all right. I mean, it's it's a cool discovery uh, for the exact same reasons. You know, it, I think. It's one of those things I just didn't anticipate, even though we had thought about it a lot. We knew we were going to land off on the plains of Yale Crater, and we even knew that we'd land on top of a, what we call an alluvial fan, uh, like a stream coming down from the mountain that spread debris across the crater floor, just like what you see in, the, in a desert environment on Earth, uh, this broad fan. And, and for, all, you know, for all we could tell from orbit, that fan was laid down by water that once flowed in a stream and spread out that fan. But when we actually landed, and even the day of landing, you know, we got pictures the next day, and uh, the rocket engines had scoured away the, the gravel that we landed on and revealed some of these rocks that were eroding away, and all the, all the little rocks that were falling out of the bedrock were these little kind of marble-sized, golf-ball-sized, rounded pebbles. And, you know, the geologists on the team just scratched their heads and thought, you know, on Earth... The, the, the best way, the most common way we round pebbles is by transporting them in a stream. And when you put that together with the fact that we, you know, we, we see the outlines of streams from orbit, it just all of a sudden we had this epiphany that we were driving for the first time on Mars through an ancient stream bed where water once flowed, you know, up to your hip if you were standing there and probably came from 10 miles away on the crater rim bringing all these little pebbles with it and rolling along and, and rounding them. So it's, it's spectacular. I love it. That's you. What's your favorite? Well, I think I have, a, you know, of course, everybody, we're all talking about uh, the, the water, which is my favorite as well. Uh, one of the things that sticks with me is the, is the moments of, of discovery can take many different forms and in some ways for me one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is when I the first thing I do when I come in in the morning and we, uh, is to is to take a look at images from Mars and yeah there's sometimes when we look at them and I go wait is that is that Arizona no that must be Mars right and 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 you have that moment but also there are other moments when you when you see them as a team and there's that first moment I remember when we did one of our first drillings and and I was hearing the scientists say that the the tailings were kind of a different color than they expected or I walked into the the mission control area and saw the images of the of the pebbles and thought okay you know as a lay person as an engineer I can tell that looks like water was involved but so it's 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 almost the moments for me as part of the engineering team it's it's those first moments when we as the team see something and you certainly don't know what it is but it's the moment where or you first hear the sci you know the chief scientists say the water is drinkable on Mars or you see the scientists react to the color of something it's 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 seeing them as a team and wondering what it means but that that moment of of initial discovery, I find very, find very rewarding. Very rewarding. That's so cool. amazing. Yeah. Um, Is Matt back? Do we have Matt yet? Yeah, he's. No. I don't see him. I think because the rover's driving behind. Around. him. Oh man, you can see things behind you, Nagi, moving around. It's yeah. so cool. <laughs> she was just driving. <laughs> there she goes. That's awesome. Yay. Amy, what about you? What's your What's yeah. your most exciting thing? Uh, discovery? I don't know if I... I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a bad answer. I think my favorite was probably, aside from actually being on, on, you know, not on Mars, obviously, at JPL when it landed, which is a pretty amazing place to be that night, but um, when Curiosity sent back the first oh, yeah. high-resolution panorama um, mm -hmm. that just showed Mars in unprecedented detail that you could actually zoom in on and actually really look at the detail, it was just sort of like, okay, this is... It makes it so much more real, I think, for the non-scientists to be able to see something and to be able to actually... And I was living in Arizona at the time, and it really did look like the areas around where I lived, so it was kind of weird to be like, this is so, so detailed, and I could have gone outside and taken this picture, but it's on Mars, and that's awesome. So I'm a big fan of these beautiful mosaics that are being sent back all the time. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's my favorite. Is obviously. That's my favorite, yeah, I think. It's just the, the beautiful imagery, being able to see it all. Why did you think it was something else, Ian? 
<laughs> I thought I thought it was the selfies. I like the selfies. You I think like that's a good really selfie. amazing. I do enjoy a good selfie, like like <laughs> any good nerd, I guess, or internet person. Um, now I like the I do like the selfies only because it's easy to forget what it is that's up there. You know, this giant piece of machinery that's so intricately designed and planned. It's it's easy to forget that oh that it's not just a dude with an iPhone. You know, because we're because there's so many photos around the world that we see these days, and they're they're ubiquitous. Taken more photos in the last, you know, since the cell phone was got a camera than we did in the entirety of human history. So it's easy to forget where photos come from. So I, I do enjoy it when when you see the machinery that's responsible and, and appreciate that. You know, I think one of my favorites was the photo of the um, the penny. That one I really liked. I thought that was really cool because it it wasn't yeah. it was also you know like kind of nationalistic and interesting in that way, but it was like so, something that you could hold in your hand and now it's on Mars. Yeah, it's something profound seeing that because when I first saw when I saw um, Curiosity in um, in JPL actually it was in 2012 I think before it got shipped to uh, Florida, and um, and actually seeing that thing up close and seeing the hardware and then seeing that entire machine now on the surface of Mars, it made that kind of profound connection. So I think whenever you see something that was once on Earth on a different right. planet, that you just realise the the, ingen the ingenuity, you know. That that sense of nostalgia is also is, is something we're now starting to get used to in terms of seeing the selfies and seeing the amazing images that come down from the orbiters. But I actually remember on Spirit and Opportunity one of the first days that we got a very high resolution image back of one of the rovers, and honestly, it felt like work stopped, uh, you know, in the operations building because we had almost reconciled ourselves to you know, never seeing her again, so to speak, with our own eyes. And then the rover lasted long enough for uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to get there with this amazing camera. And we started seeing these remarkable pictures of the rover. And our reaction was one of, you know, kind of nostalgic, almost paternal reaction. Look, there's the rover. We can even see her mask. Uh, something we didn't, it's like seeing your, 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 uh, your offspring when you never expected to see them again in person and here's an, an image that shows you them uh, on the other planet and it, it has a very strong emotional reaction for those who help build it. Yeah, and that's another thing I found. I've spoken to rover drivers before, especially with um, Opportunity and Spirit. There's this very, there's this uh, tangible feeling of family. Whenever you talk about the rovers, they are, they're more than robots. <laughs> they're yeah. not robots anymore. Yeah, I think that, I think people seem, even, even lay people, I think that's one of the most exciting things about the rover programs is that even lay people get kind of excited about, it's not just a, you know, just a, a, a race car, like a remote control car on Mars. It's, there's, it's got a kind of personality because of just the way we, we talk about it and we think about it, I think. It looks like we got Matt back. Matt, we were just talking about what, um, Ian, how did you word it? What did the best discovery, your favorite discovery was? Yeah, you know, we've had a lot of questions on the same theme. Basically, what's your favorite discovery or your favorite thing about the mission so far? Uh, my favorite discovery was on Sol 16 when we discovered we had a rover and not a lander. Uh, that was the first day that we drove. <laughs> yes. uh, and for me, who has spent my you know time doing mobility and leading up to make sure we have a mission where we can actually explore more than one spot on Mars, uh, seeing those tracks that came down and uh, knowing that the team who built this rover did an amazing job and the team who landed this rover did an amazing job and that all of us had a job that we uh, got to go do. That was my favorite part. That's so awesome. cool. Well, we're about out of time. Does anybody you have a last question you want to ask? And what's the what's the future plans? What's the, what's the next what's the next couple of years look like for Curiosity? So the next uh, couple of years. Oh, I'll I'll guess I'll start. Um, we're okay. you know, we quickly throw up the image traverse map. Mm. Uh, we are about. Well, actually, we're a little bit more than halfway now uh, from Yellowknife Bay, which was near our landing site, to the foothills of Mount Sharp. So we're really getting there. And thanks to Matt and all the other rover drivers, we've been really um, 
killing it in terms of getting distance every day. You can see where we started it up in the upper right, um, Yellowknife Bay and Bradbury Landing. And then the red path is what we've uh, done so far. And the white path is what we have left to do until we get to Murray Buttes, which is kind of the gateway to the foothills of Mount Sharp. We hopefully will be there in a few months, and then we'll spend the next couple of years climbing up that 500 meters of elevation through all the clays, through all the sulfates, and seeing the you know ancient early history of Mars as the climate's changing from wet to dry, seeing that viscerally like in the rocks and, and really seeing Mars come to life. Cool. And then, Amy, I think you had one, one last question. We'll round out. Yeah, this is a sort of... I don't want to say backtracking, but getting away from sort of the wonder of discovery a little bit, because I've been asked this question on Twitter a lot, and I don't have an answer. Um, so this is kind of inspired by, and I, I hate to bring it up, but um, the Mars Polar Lander, in which there was some confusion over measurements and the lander kind of smashed into Mars. Um, so the question that a lot of people have is, have you ever had any problems coordinating between Earth days and Mars days? being souls, um, and sort of missed an uplink or sort of all of a sudden found yourself that you're not in the right place. Um, I sort of can't imagine this happening on Curiosity because you guys are kind of pros um, by now, but did, has this ever happened? Has there been a sort of time issues working between two planets? Well, we haven't had, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at that in the beginning, that the, the fact that we are, that there is a time difference and that, that working Earth time versus Mars time is something that, again, from the other missions that uh, we definitely know we're going to encounter. So we actually start planning for it very early with our operational readiness tests. We do, we have a lot of tools to help us keep track of time and it's absolutely true that it, it can get confusing you know between earth time and mars time but uh, knowing that we have uh, a lot of methods in place uh, to make sure that we stay in sync we have in fact in the operations room there are, there are many different clocks uh, that help us be aware we have not you know missed an uplink or had any sort of mishap so to speak because of the time systems uh, being different than we expected uh, but a lot of that, the credit to that, again, goes to the early missions, uh, going back to Viking and to Pathfinder. And we have the benefit of, of being able to, to pick up where the prior mission left off. And in fact, InSight, which will be launching soon, has the same benefits. And so we're able to take the tools that we used on previous missions, improve on them. And, and so we've been, uh, we've been reaping the benefits of that approach. And we haven't had any issues. Uh, other than being Earthlings trying to think in a Mars frame. Great. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for this month. Matt, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks they for just told us, us it's, it's 100 degrees out there today, so. It's another Woo! beautiful day in the Mars yard. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, Nagi, and thanks, Ashwin, and thanks, Amy and Ian. Thank got you. so many people out here today. Um, where can people find you guys if they want more information on Mars Curiosity, Ashwin? Oh, you can go to mars.jpl.nasa.gov mm -hmm. slash MSL. Great. And then you guys have a Facebook page, I think, as well, if people want to go there. And a Twitter handle that is... Is, is very fun. I like following the Mars Curiosity Twitter handle. Uh, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash Mars Curiosity. Uh, you can find Ian at Astro Engine. Amy, what's your handle? It's A-S-T, Vintage Space. And then and you can find me at Trace Dominguez. So thanks a lot for tuning in to our Space Out this month, everybody. If you're looking for more science every day of the week, you can come subscribe on YouTube. Um, we are DNews. You can find us on Twitter at DNews. Facebook and Google Plus is the same. If you have any suggestions for what we want to talk about now next month's Space Out, feel free to send them at us. Uh, you can hashtag Space Out on Twitter or Facebook, and we will see you next month, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank guys. guys. This was great. Yay.